And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Cataptarex, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. You say that differently than me, and I think better because I sometimes say Caudipteryx. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why I put the emphasis on the dip rather than the tear. <laughs> yeah, when I see the PT together, I think, yep, tear, like pterosaur. Yep. <laughs> And it was a basal oviraptor theropod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Liaoning province in China in the Yixiang Formation. It looked very bird-like. It was covered in black downy feathers. It had long legs, a long neck, short arms with feathers on it, tail feathers, and a rounded snout. So not exactly like a bird. Maybe if you saw it out of the corner of your eye, you'd think that's a weird-looking bird. <laughs> It was peacock-sized and estimated to be almost 2 foot 5 inches long to nearly 3 feet, or about 0.7 to 0.9 meters long, and weigh 11 pounds or 5 kilograms, and this is based on estimates from its femur. It's always amazing how large dinosaurs are for their weight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 3 feet long and 11 pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was very light. It had delicate bones. It also had a box-like skull with large eyes, a short snout, with not many teeth. These teeth were small and weak. And it had a hallux, its first toe, that may have been partly reversed or backward-facing and had body proportions like modern flightless birds. And it's pretty cool what you can learn from that first toe because based on it being partly reversed, it probably could perch like some modern birds. Yeah, that's the handy thing. You get the toes on the front of the perch and the one wrapping around the back and you get to get a sturdy grip. Yeah, although this one was only partly reversed, so I don't know how sturdy of a grip yeah, it had. A, an okay grip? Yeah. <laughs> it was a decent percher, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like early birds and the oviraptorid Heuania, it had a short third finger on its hands, and it had short claws on its hands. The hand was longer than either the humerus or radius, the arm bones. That's pretty crazy that its hand is bigger than the most of the arm. Yeah. Kind of like a bat. Yeah. And it had long legs. It probably was a fast runner. It was thought to be secondarily flightless, so it evolved from animals that could fly, but it couldn't. It did have a highly developed wishbone or furcula, like modern birds. Its wishbone was similar to Archaeopteryx, Confucius Ornus, and other non-avian theropods. That's crazy to think that it was secondarily flightless, because just going back in time, it's like, oh yeah, in the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs hadn't evolved flight yet or they were just first developing it and the fact that something developed flight and lost it before the end of the mesozoic mm -hmm. just seems so weird mm -hmm. lots of things happening in yeah. the mesozoic <laughs> it just reminds you of how much time actually passed in the even just the cretaceous alone yeah in 2019 aaron dunroy and others found that the feathers of catapteryx were black and the tail feathers had a banding pattern and its tail was short and stiff toward the tip or end, which is similar to birds and oviraptorosaurs. It was that stiff tip towards the end. It's basically a fan of feathers on the tail. Yeah, it's like a pyga style. It's a, similar to like if you look at a hawk or something, they have those fans of feathers. Mm -hmm. It has a similar sort of end to its tail. So they're like, oh, it must have had a fan of feathers there. Yeah. It also had feathers with veins and barbs on its hands that were between almost six to eight inches or 15 to 20 centimeters long. And it had longer symmetrical feathers on its arms and tail, which was probably used for display or brooding because symmetrical feathers means it couldn't fly. Most likely. But also its proportions were not really bird size. Yeah. And it had downy feathers that probably kept it warm. In 2018, Yasser Talarai and others experimented with a robot Cataptarex with realistic wing proportions to test if the feathers on the wings helped it run faster. You just like the idea of a robot dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> Flapping robotic wings to get a little extra speed. Yeah. They found that if the wings were fixed and extended out, it would have only helped with small amounts of lift and drag, and the same with flapping while running. So based on the results, they found that its feathers were probably for display. It's possible the feathers helped with turning, like they do with ostriches. The next year, in 2019... Yasser Talarai and others re-examined how Cataptarox used its feathers, and they used the robot again, and they estimated its max running speed to be about 8 meters per second. They found that while running, there would have been some forced vibrations that would have taught it to flap its wings. And then in 2022, Jing Shang Zhao and others, including Yasser Talarai, went back to the Cataptarox robot, and they found more support that flapping evolved 
long before feathered dinosaurs could fly. They flapped while running on the ground. That's that grounds up versus trees down. So mm-hmm. their, their team grounds up, at least for caudipteryx. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting that while running, though, you, you've got these vibrations happening. And it's like, oh, I'm going to flap my wings yeah. now. Well, it's sort of like us, right? When we walk, it like gets our arms moving. Mm-hmm. You know, like you go with the opposite arm. Unless you start thinking about it too much, and then it's hard to remember how your arms move. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they probably had a natural sort of rhythm to their arms. And then it might have gone more flap-like. Yeah. A caudipteryx was probably omnivorous, though it's possible it was an herbivore. Possibly it ate insects and plants. Two individuals have been found with gastroliths. And caudipteryx had a long neck with 10 vertebrae, although a later individual was found with 12 vertebrae. So based on the neck and gastroliths, they think, well, maybe it was herbivorous. There's two species of caudipteryx, caudipteryx zoi and caudipteryx stongi. The type species is caudipteryx zoi. The genus name, Caudipteryx, means tail feather. It was named by Ji Chiang and others in 1998. Several skeletons have been found. The first bones were found in 1997, so it was named shortly after it was found. The type specimen was close to mature when it died, and that's based on fusions and ossifications in the bones. The species name, Zoi, refers to, quote, Zhou Jiahua, vice premier of China and an avid supporter of the scientific work in Liaoning, end quote. The second species, Caudipteryx dongai, was named in 2000 by Zhang Hizhou and Xiaolin Wan. A nearly complete skeleton was found in 1998 with well-preserved wing feathers and nearly complete arms, hind limbs, and a pelvis, but no skull was found. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought that the feathers were all just inferred. I didn't realize there was a specimen that actually had preserved. I guess I've only looked at the holotype. (laughs) Yeah. That's so cool. Which is why they can tell the coloring and all these cool details. Yeah. So this was more articulated than the type species, and it was a large individual. Caudipteryx dongai had a relatively long upper half of the pelvis compared to Caudipteryx zoi, and a smaller sternum or middle part of the chest. And it had a short first toe or hallux that does face backwards, so it may have been able to perch. There were also skin impressions on the arms and hands. And, quote, the skin doubles the width of the digits when the animal was alive, end quote. So it wasn't shrink-wrapped. No. It's a meat on those fingers. <laughs> <laughs> the species name Dongai refers to Juming Dong, a distinguished Chinese dinosaur expert. Now, not all scientists think that Caudipteryx was an oviraptor. Some scientists think it was a bird. Huh. I mean, it was very bird-like. Yeah. And because of Caudipteryx, there's been a lot of debate about how birds and dinosaurs are related. So in 1998, when Caudipteryx was named, there was a debate on the origin and evolution of early birds and whether they evolved from Silurosaurian theropods. Yeah, I suppose if it's a flightless bird, that makes it a bird. Mm-hmm. Even if it sort of looks like an oviraptor, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Then it would have to be a Silurosaurian, since we think those are the ones that became birds. Yeah, and Silurosaurus, they're a type of theropod, but they include a bunch of other groups like Compsognathids, Tyrannosaurs, or Nithomimosaurs, and Manoraptora includes birds. So when Caudipteryx was named, the author said that it represents, quote, stages in the evolution of birds from feathered, ground-living, bipedal dinosaurs, end quote. Oh, and really cool, there was a clump of feathers preserved on the chest. The authors named Caudipteryx based on two nearly complete, partially articulated skeletons with feather impressions on the arms, tail, and body. Again, that was found in 1997. Originally, they thought it was a manoraptor that's closer to birds than other dinosaurs, but there's been a lot of discussion since, and it's been compared with oviraptors and flightless birds. When it was described, Caudipteryx, it was thought to provide the first evidence of feathers in dinosaurs. But Zhou and Wang wrote, quote, This opinion, however, has been challenged by many paleontologists who suggest that Caudipteryx was probably a flightless bird, a Mesozoic kiwi. (laughs) (laughs) I think it looks more like a Mesozoic rhea or like a small Mesozoic emu. Oh, because of the long legs? Although kiwi birds have long legs. They do, but this one has big arms. Mm. Kiwis are like, their whole thing is they're a little fluff ball with no arms. That's true. (laughs) (laughs) In the paper naming Caudipteryx dongai, They interpreted Caudipteryx as a feathered dinosaur, but the author said, quote, We believe the debate on the dinosaurian or avian state of Caudipteryx and oviraptorids will continue, end quote. 
In 2000, Jones and others said Cotopteryx was a flightless bird based on comparing body proportions of flightless birds and non-avian theropods. And plus they had the specimen with a whole bunch of feather impressions to work with at that point. Yeah. <laughs> in 2002, Teresa Marianska and others found Cotopteryx to be both an overraptor and a bird. <laughs> it had feathers and the overraptors were found to brood eggs. In 2005, Gareth Dyke and Mark Norell found Cotopteryx to be a non-avian theropod and not a flightless bird. The proportions of the leg bones and center of mass are more similar to modern running or cursorial birds than non-avian theropods, which is why some scientists found it to be a flightless bird. Dyke and Norell argued that the conclusion that Cotopteryx was a flightless bird was based on the assumption that birds are not related to non-bird theropods. Lawrence Whitmer said, quote, the presence of unambiguous feathers in an unambiguously non-avian theropod has the rhetorical impact of an atomic bomb, <laughs> rendering any doubt about the theropod relationships of birds ludicrous, end quote. Uh. That's quite the quote. <laughs> in 2000, Xiaoling Wang and others studied two new specimens of Cotopteryx, and each had skulls and were nearly completely articulated. So those are very good specimens. One they referred to Cotopteryx zoi, and the other was an indeterminate species. But they found lots of bird-like features, and yet still found it to be a feathered dinosaur. That's where they found the hallux that was at least partially reversed or backward, so the ancestor of Cotopteryx probably was able to hang out in trees. And the specimens that they studied were slightly smaller than the other specimens that had been found, but their leg-to-arm ratio was similar compared to the larger specimens, and that may mean that the arms developed earlier than the legs. So now we'll get into the part that ties into our mini season here. In 2021, Xiaoting Zheng and others studied cartilage of Cotopteryx. So Ooh. there we go. We've got soft tissue. More than just feathers. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess, yeah, we did talk about feathers already. <laughs> <laughs> they demineralized the material and said it, quote, shows exquisite preservation, end quote. They found chondrocytes, which maintain cartilage, and one had a nucleus and, quote, fossilized threads of chromatin, end quote. That's a mix of DNA and proteins that form the chromosomes found in cells. And they said it, quote, retained some of their original chemistry, end quote. Mm. They said it was the second example of fossilized chromatin threads. The first one was found in cartilage of the hadrosaur Hippacrosaurus. In the paper, they wrote, quote, these data show that some of the original nuclear biochemistry is preserved in its dinosaur cartilage material and further support the hypothesis that cartilage is very prone to nuclear fossilization and a perfect candidate to further understand DNA preservation in deep time, end quote. So it's a pretty big find. Understanding DNA preservation, those are strong words. I know. Because they I think the chemistry that they found is very distant from <laughs> DNA, it's like more simple molecules, but mm. yeah. Well, they said that the nuclei was thought to degrade quickly after death, but there are a lot of fossil tissues with preserved nuclei, quote, from permafrost, preserved Cenozoic mammals, Mesozoic dinosaurs, various Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic plants, and even embryo-like fossil cell clusters that are more than 600 million years old, end quote. But yeah, permafrost really helps preserve. 600 million years old is crazy. But I think what they're talking about there is that, like, we can see the shape of them, mm -hmm. not get DNA from them. <laughs> right. They also said that recent taphonomy experiments on plants and algae showed nuclei to be more stable and decay slower than previously thought. Cartilage found in mammals is, quote, one of the most durable and decay-resistant soft tissues of the body, end quote. And that's because it's shielded by surrounding tissues. There's no vascularization, blood vessels, which protects from microbial invasions. And there's a, quote, low cell density and its cells have an anaerobic metabolism, end quote, so no oxygen. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, oxygen is basically one of the biggest things that causes decay. And then after that, like you were saying, if there are blood vessels or something that can carry in bacteria or some kind of infection or even just after the animal dies, keeps everything wet mm -hmm. and, you know, available for attack, you can see how this would last a really long time. Yeah. Plus, I don't think there's that much nutritional value in it, which is another benefit. Yeah. Chondrocytes have a delay when it comes to the self-destruction of cells and tissues. And this is known as autolysis. 
and that helps fossilize nuclei. And calcified cartilage seems to be even more decay resistant. So it's not surprising that fossilized calcified cartilage has, quote, exceptional cellular and nuclear preservation, regardless of the age of the fossil, end quote. So it may take a few weeks for chondrocytes to decay after an animal dies, which means in order for nuclear preservation in cartilage, the animal doesn't need to be buried immediately. They compared Cotopteryx to a chicken and found similarities. Based on the chemistry of the tissues and surrounding sediments of Cotopteryx, they found iron and other materials helped in the preservation, which we talked about in the first episode of this mini-series. And these other materials are common in the Jehol biota. And that's a place where we find tons of little bird-like dinosaurs with really well-preserved feathers, too. Yeah, although the iron kind of came later in the preservation process. They also found a cartilage cell nucleus, which has genetic material. And they said, quote, some of the original nuclear biochemistry is preserved in this dinosaur cartilage material. And then I'm going to share a long quote because I felt like I couldn't summarize it as well. (laughs) Maybe I can summarize it when you're done. Okay. (laughs) They wrote, quote, it was recently proposed that even though DNA is apparently in a non-PCR amplifiable and non-sequenceable form in Mesozoic fossils, some of the original chemistry and molecules may still be preserved in the form of DNA fossilization products. This may explain why some dinosaur cells can still react with DNA stains, even though a DNA sequence has never been authenticated in any fossil much older than about 1.2 million years. Although the results presented here are preliminary chemical data, they still support the hypothesis concerning DNA fossilization products and reaffirm that much more efforts need to be made to investigate all the unanswered questions about DNA preservation in deep time, especially in fossilized cartilage, end quote. That's a fantastic quote. Yeah. But basically, I guess what they're saying is the DNA isn't in a complete state and PCR the whole thing that it does is it replicates entire DNA strains. So they're saying the PCR technology doesn't work because it's not in its original, you know, full DNA chunk, or at least full enough to be replicable. But there are little pieces of it which are recognizable to other molecules that just latch on to DNA Mm -hmm. and change the color when they hit it. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are a lot of pieces of DNA there. They're just too small to be useful with our current technology. Yeah. But that is kind of hopeful because I keep thinking like, well, maybe in the future, if we had some amazing technology, we could put all those little tiny pieces back together if we had enough samples and like some really powerful AI to figure out how it might fit together. But the pieces from what I've seen are really, really small, like fractions of a protein. Mm. And you need like multiple protein segments together to sort of recreate the DNA. Yeah. The pieces exist. Yeah, the, there are pieces. There are pieces. <laughs> Who knows if they'll come together to form anything. Yeah, but. if there are enough pieces. Yeah, so that's a lot of soft tissue with Cotopteryx. And some other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Cotopteryx include the Tyrannosauroid Delong and the Dromaeosaur Cynornithosaurus. And talking about cartilage is actually going to be a really good segue to our third episode in this mini season, so stay tuned for that. For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino or click the link on the left. 